Okay, welcome back to part two of the Alpha 9 video, where here I'm going to be talking about some of the exposure modes and the focusing modes. And hopefully after I do it, some of the things that are a little bit confusing might become a lot more clearer. So let me start with a single focusing point. You can get to the focusing mode by hitting the function button and then going over to here, focus area. Now you have many different choices here. I'm going to go right now to flexible spot. And when you have flexible spot, you can then use the left and right arrows to choose a different size of flexible spot. You can go medium, you can go large, or you can go small. For this example, let's just use small. And you can see it right there. Now it's kind of in the center. What does it focus on? Here's a horizontal line. Let's see how well it does. I'm going to press the shutter release button halfway. Now I'm in AFC mode. And you can tell that because of the parentheses around the green dot in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. That means it thinks it found something, but it's continuing to reevaluate the distance between the camera and the subject. So normally, conventional wisdom says that you give it some kind of contrast, and it'll do a really good job of figuring out where things are. And with horizontal contrast, it turns out the camera really has no idea. But if you give it vertical contrast, it's a completely different story. It finds it right away. Let's try that again. Horizontal is not really too sure, but if you move the line to vertical contrast, it gets it right away. Does that happen with all the focusing points? Let's move it to a second one. I'm going to use the joystick on the back. Let's uh, pick one like over here. And same test again. I'll press the shutter release button halfway. I'll give it a horizontal line and it's not really too sure what to do. I will give it a vertical line. And sure enough, it just zaps right onto it. So the moral to the story is all of the phase detect autofocus points on the camera sensor are blind to horizontal contrast. You need to have vertical contrast like this in order to make it work. Why haven't you noticed this before? Because you probably never took pictures of pure horizontal lines before. That's an easy one. You can actually change the size of that little square. Go to the function area and go to the focus area. Now, most of your other focusing choices have to do with changing the size of that little tiny focusing square. The first example we have is the flexible spot. You can go to small, medium, and large. Large, as you can see, makes it a larger square. Too, too small for you still? You can head over to the focus area and go to something even larger, like zone. Zone is like a really, really big square. It's like a whole quadrant of the viewfinder. So that's what these do, just changing the size of the autofocus area. There's a couple other choices. Center, which by the way, is exactly the same thing as the flexible spot large. The only difference is you can't move it around. What other choices are there? Well, you got something called expanded flexible spot, which is yet another size. That way it's 120% uh, you know, bigger than the other ones, but not nearly as big a zone. So you have a lot of choices for size. Some people will say too many. Now, what's this last one? Last one is called lock-on AF, and it's used for tracking subjects as they go around the frame. I'll talk about how that works in just a minute. But first, let's talk about how the camera does when it's presented with things that are close and things that are far. How does the camera choose what the subject is? So the camera actually has two heuristics. The first one is, if you had two different subjects, place two different distances apart, focus on the one that's closest. You can see that here. If that one goes away, it'll focus on whatever's next closest. Heuristic number two is ignore heuristic number one if you find a face. And I happen to have a Sears portrait special right here. Now watch what the camera does. It's going to be in focusing mode. It'll be constantly reevaluating the distance between the subject and. And there we go. Even though it's further away, it found a face, and therefore it's going to be concentrating the face. Take it away, it goes back to focusing on whatever was closest. Put it there, and it finds the face. So that's how your camera makes a choice in wide area autofocus mode. It does a very good job. If you're shooting weddings, you're shooting the kids, this is a really great mode and it makes good decisions most of the time. And as we saw in the previous video, if it ever makes a wrong decision, I can very quickly override it by putting the subject I want in the center and pressing the center of the button right there. It's telling the camera, that's my subject, lock onto that, and then I can recompose and shoot and do whatever I need. 
So those are the great choices you have. Either let the camera do what it wants to do, and it's very good at it, or you can choose a focusing point and move it around the screen using the multi-selector. Sometimes it's also called the joystick. Now there's two other modes that are used for tracking subjects as they move across the screen. Let me show you the oldest one first. It's called Center Lock-On AF, and it works like this. There we go, camera one, screen five, center lock on AF, it's off. And we're gonna turn it on right now. And when that happens, it gives you instructions. It says it'll track the nearest subject to the screen. All right, what it's telling you to do is to put your subject in the center and then press the center of the rear wheel like this. And what it'll do is it'll make note of what the subject looks like and then it'll try to track it as it moves left and right up and down throughout the frame. This, even if something is closer, it will recognize the object that you registered and it will track it along and keep the focusing going. This is great for movies, especially if you've got actors going back and forth across the stage. You just register them once and the camera will do its best to track it. Not so good for sports, especially if your child is wearing the same jersey color as all the other kids on his team. The camera will get very confused because the color and the intensity and the contrast will all look the same and it won't be able to track it. The downside to this is you've got to register your subject with the camera. You've got to put it in the center and then say, this is my subject, track it. Is there a way to track a subject without that initial manual step? The answer is yes. And that's where the new feature is. It's called Lock-On AF. It gets very confusing because they're similarly named. In order for it to be used, you have to turn this feature off. So let me turn the center lock on AF off, like that. And then we're going to involve, invoke the new one, which will only be used on stills, by the way, not on video. So uh, I'm going to go through the focus area menu here. As we mentioned earlier, all this does is take you through different sizes of a spot. And the very last item here is lock on AF wide. Now you can also go left and right when you're going the menu here. See the left and right arrows by the icon? If you do that, you start to see other options which happen to coincide with the options above this one in the menu. So you have lock on AF wide and then zone and then center, flexible spot, different sizes, expanded flexible spot, and then wide again. I'm gonna just choose wide for the time being. So as I mentioned, the center lock on AF, you tell the camera, this is my subject, track it. Can the camera figure out what the subject is without you having to tell it first? The answer is yes, and it uses the same heuristics as we saw earlier. It'll find something whatever's closest, or if it has a face, it'll track that automatically. Let's, let's get the face back. There we are. I'm not even gonna tell it anything. I'm just gonna press the shutter release button down halfway and you can see the double green squares around the face. That means I found the subject, I'm gonna keep tracking it, even as it goes across the screen, left, right, up, down. No manual step for registering your subject is necessary. It's a very handy thing. And again, I keep this as my standard mode all the time. And if I ever, if the camera ever makes a bad choice, then I can quickly override it. But as you can see, my philosophy is let the camera do its awesome automation stuff as much as it can, and then just make sure you can override it quickly in case it guesses badly. So those are the focusing modes in a nutshell. Now let me talk about the metering modes. Metering modes, as you know, is different than focusing, and you can get to them by the function button, metering mode, and you have many different choices, five to be exact. Let me start with the most basic. This one takes us back in time to the 1950s, average. And uh, to help out, let me just uh, use this quick little light here, which impersonates difficult light. And when you have something really, really bright and really, really dark, an average camera will try to average everything together, bright lights, dark lights. If this is your subject, it's doing a very bad job exposing for it because it's trying to take everything into account. A little bit later in the 1950s, Nikon invented something called center-weighted metering, which, believe it or not, appears in this camera. Uh, here it is, the metering mode. There it is, center-weighted metering. Now, with center-weighted metering, the idea is whatever's in the center of your image is going to count for more than whatever's in the corner. Let's try that again. As it moves from the corner to the center, it starts to count more when the camera is determining what the exposure, what it's going to meter for. Now, this is great if you're not a fan of the rule of thirds, 
But this is what it did. The Nikon F2AS worked for this for almost a decade. All Nikon metering was like this. And it made a pretty good decision in greater amounts of areas. Then somebody decided, well, how do, we, how do we make this even better? And Nikon, once again, was the leader in the field. They came out with something called matrix metering, which Canon calls evaluative metering, which Sony calls multi-segment metering. It all does the same thing. And it's so good that I actually keep it as my default metering mode. Here it is. It's the very first option. It's called multi-segment. Now, what multi-segment metering does is it breaks down the image into smaller components. Every camera has a different amount, but basically it has a little tiny database inside, and it recognizes a light distribution of a bad exposure. And it also has in the corner what to do to fix it. For example, in this graphic, there's a classic backlit person, and the camera is programmed to say if you see a light distribution that looks like this, it's probably a backlight person. Fix it by overexposing by one and a quarter stops, and you're done. Multi-second metering mode has a great track record. It's so good that I keep it on as uh, my default. And whenever the lighting gets really difficult where it makes bad guesses, then my instant go-to change is something called Spot AEL Toggle. And I actually assigned that to a button. Uh, let me show you how it was done. Camera 2, number 8, custom key shooting, AEL buttons on the right, there it is. And it's assigned to spot AEL toggle. The spot is a little icon next to the letters AEL. Here's what it means. First, let me talk about spot metering mode. And then I'll tell you about how this feature gets you to spot metering mode much quicker than using the function button. When you're in the function the metering mode, the third option is spot metering. And you have two different sizes, large and standard. Let's put standard for right now. And when you choose it, you'll see a small circle appear in the center of your frame. The camera is using only the information in the center to determine its exposure. So if you put a white, put a white cardboard there, it'll get a little bit darker. If you put black cardboard there, it'll get a little bit brighter because it's trying to make things look 18% gray. If you have a really bright light up there, what will it do? It will only pay attention to the very, very center of the image and pay no attention whatsoever if the light is just outside that circle. So it's kind of like center weighted metering, but a lot more exacting. It's very useful if you're shooting people in the theater or rock concerts where you have guitar players that are very well lit by the spotlights, but very, very almost no lighting behind them at all. This will fool most camera exposure meters, and for decades, my go-to solution to difficult lighting like that was to assign a spot AEL toggle to my AEL button. My AEL button is right over there. And then when it came time to getting the difficult lighting, I would simply point my subject in the center of the image and say, camera, that's my subject. I want you to expose just for that. And there you go. And then I can focus, recompose, shoot, do whatever I need to do. And it will lock the exposure, as you can see. I, I, can, I can move things around. It'll lock the exposure until I hit the AEL button again. And then it goes back to averaging everything together. What do the other settings do? Well, there's one other one. It's called Highlight. And it works very similarly to the spot metering, where you spot AEL toggle. Here's what it's doing. It's going over and evaluating the light in every corner of the image. And it's looking for the brightest part and it's assuming the brightest part is going to be its subject, so it's going to expose for that. No longer do you need to put the camera into spot metering mode and then hit the spot AEL toggle button. Sony has saved you a step. This is great for theater lighting. It will meter for the brightest part on your stage. Now again, theater lighting will almost always throw off all your camera meters. So this is a very, very handy mode for doing just that. All roads lead to Rome. Many of these features may seem similar to you. That's okay. Remember, just pick two and use those exclusively. And don't try to get it caught up on memorizing every single feature and what it does. And when you're out in the field, you don't want anything detracting you from the light and the composition and the creativity. You want the camera to be an extension of you. Figure out which tools work best for you. Use just those, and you can safely ignore everything else. So that's a quick rundown of the Sony A9, and I hope this information has been useful to you. If you want even more detail, I may have mentioned a book that I just finished reading. You can learn more about it right over here. 
The book is available in many different formats, including PDF, Kindle formats, and for all other e-readers, and printed versions are available as well. Don't forget, the downloadable versions carry a two-week money-back guarantee if you buy them off my website. If you're not thrilled within two weeks, let me know. I'll give you a full and courteous refund. Thanks so much for joining me, and enjoy exploring your world with the A9.